Well, the world might be a small place, but it's very difficult to be in two places at once. So, first, I just thank everyone for the invitation, and I'm very sorry not to be able to participate in the uh, what's going to be a very fascinating series of panel discussions. Um, the future of technology is a topic that has always fascinated me, and the, um, in the session of digital publics, I've been quite stretched thinking how I could fold my um, my preoccupations of uh, current te technical development in the building site with the theme. And um, so I'm looking at the idea of public engagement with the building site and um, the, the visual account of um, advances in the construction technology from in the living laboratory because um, handled in the right way, a, living, uh, a building site is a, a living laboratory, I, I think. So my um, proposition is that uh, the technological shifts in the building industry over the last decade have been profound. We all agree with this, not just in the representation of ideas within the studio, but also on site. Um, and the file to factory opportunities are really leaping ahead. And as, but the um, related uh, shifts in practice that result are not easy to communicate to the wider community of designers, builders, builders building users, and of course the general public. And the building site needs to be more open for scrutiny, I contend, not protected from it. And how might the building site become more of a show? So I'm going to quickly summarize the um, shifts that have occurred in the last 10 years at the Scrap Chameleon, just to um, give a sense of what I think have been the, the big the innovations that have affected us. And. Um, Curiously, the Sagrada Familia has always been a living laboratory in the sense that I've just described, a building site that's to inform the public and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the profession. And it's been like that since uh, 1883, which is when Gaudi took the project on. And he worked on it until uh, 1926 for 43 years. Always very hospitable towards the visitor. And that's why we have any knowledge about his working um, style, the only reason we have any knowledge of his working style is the fact that he did take so many visitors and did explain the project to them. He never wrote anything, there's nothing written by Gaudi on his work. Um, now the project is actually going to be finished in the sense of being inaugurated on November the 7th of this year, um, which is um, for those people who visited the building recently will be a surprise because it looks like it was anything but in a position to be able to receive the 7,000 uh, guests who are going to be the audience to the Pope. And there it is. I'm on to slide four, I hope now, which is the section of the building that was published shortly before Gaudi's death. And it's a, an ironic uh, drawing, this one, because everything that's hatched is in fact that which is still to be built um, on the project, but on the inside, the building is more or less finished and certainly will be in uh, November. So this building has been, I believe, a, a model for many of the uh, millions of visitors who've come to it of uh, how a building might be built that is extremely demanding in all its technical aspects. And so there's a certain loss of opportunity coming, I believe, and I'm curious to know how we might fulfill that from other sources. So the, the first innovation that um, has been very profound in the last five years has been the shared 3D model. Um, we didn't share models initially because of the fact that everybody in the office here works in different technologies and different um, programs. And least of all, uh, the fact that most people do not work parametrically. But once we got to this part of the building, which is the first of the major areas of the hatched section I just showed you, which is the large space above the, uh, the, the center of the church, uh, no choice but to actually distribute the work among the team and at to start sharing the digital model. Um, this is the, the space, these colors of these elements, it's, it's the meta design for the, or the parametric design schema for the project. And each of these colors represent different parts of the building. Um, the next slide is um, the, um, the, one of the, the main points of this for me, which is the point that analog and digital uh, design decision-making rests in the same space. In fact, the slide here where you should be seeing the engineer Carlos Bouchere standing in front of a digital projection of the space I've just been referring to 
And on the right hand side, you can see the state of the model, which um, is, is, is an incredible fusion of uh, the plaster of Paris techniques that Gaudi himself had used. You can see the slightly more orange, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor um, in this, but that area here in the center of the model is the uh, rapid prototypes. There's aluminum tubes at the top, which are uh, sort of provisional items. And the discussion is about the number of columns that are going to support the main tower over the space. And uh, so the innovation here, I believe, is the fact that the builders, the architects, the cost consultants, we're all one team with the architects and all decisions are made at the beginning. But more crucially, this space that you're seeing this uh, conversation taking place is in a, a very large workshop, which is um, separated from the public only by a very large glass screen. So although the audience uh, going past wouldn't necessarily be able to listen to the conversation, they will be very aware of, of the design process as it's being undertaken. The other big innovation this, year, this uh, last decade has been the rapid prototyping opportunity where we've literally taken the traditional plaster hand modeling techniques and put it through these digital printers, which everybody's now familiar with. Um, but when you're working with a, a head model maker who's been doing this for 48 years and you ask him the question, is this belittling his craft? The answer was a surprising uh, um, no, that he feels that this is a way of getting more done in the working week. It still relies on their technique as model makers. They don't have to be working with gloriously you know, wet uh, plaster up to their um, eyeballs uh, and at a profoundly slow rate compared to what we're able to do. These three models here are versions of that space. They were all printed in the space of one week, which means that decision-making has become a much uh, more rapid uh, event. And here you can see the uh, section of the building. Um, the model, model makers say that this scale, which is one to 100, is impossible to do with plaster of Paris. Uh, we could obviously do it over a period of years, but not in a couple of days, which is how long it took this uh, file to factory edition to come. Then the next slide is the top of the crossing. That's the center of the building, looking out towards the apt dome, which is the next project, I'm gonna, part of the project I'm gonna quickly discuss. But the point I want to make here is this slide has been taken from the bridge which the tourists can, uh, can cross when they visit the building. So all the techniques, many of which will seem very unusual, uh, well, because they are unusual, at least are on display and can be the subject conversation and uh, learning even. Um, the next part of the project, which is the great uh, dome over the um, apps, has been built off site prefabricated as one single element, which is 25 meters in diameter and 25 meters tall. Here you can see it in detail. It's um, effectively shuttering. On the left-hand side, you can see some lugs, which are actually supported stone. So it's a mixture of artificial stone and concrete and part and stone in other parts. And on, on the next slide, you can see that um, elements of the large pre the, pre, the prefabricated unit was cut up into pieces that could be at least carried on a lorry and then trucked and, and lifted up by a crane onto the site. Again, all of this that I'm showing you is perfectly visible by the visitors because that's where these photographs have been taken from their, their points of vantage. And the precision of the technique is, is clear. And the, uh, the, the, the fact that it's a 25 meter um, size building element doesn't stop it being made within a fraction of a millimeter accuracy for all the plasma and laser cutting straight from the files. And you can see a, a fusion of traditional Catalan vaulting at the same time as the reinforcements going in following the lines of forces and the geometry's description. So that's the, the state of the building from the outside. It's when you see it from the outside, you realize that there's still an awful lot to be done. So it's this kind of a curious paradox of a building which is finished on the interior, but still uh, well, at least a decade off from the exterior. And the last uh, component I want to talk about in detail is the, that of stone, where the innovation of the last two years has made all that happened in the previous eight years seem ridiculously uh, last century, although we thought it was pretty good at the time. 
what we're now doing is actually designing the, the pieces of masonry as as blocks which are then custom cut from the, the site in, in france using this giant saw so no no more blasting um, but actually cutting, uh, the bits to order which means that we're minimizing the amount of material that's being purchased and also the amount of material that has to be trucked on site the, um, the, the construction is completely robotized. It's actually a five axis robot you're seeing on the left and on the right is a two um, axis turntable. And the stonemason who's from a, a several generations of, of, of stonemasons from the same family, he's the person who's actually engineered this arrangement. He's the person who's actually written the software that will allow these two independent devices to work together, allowing him to produce more. So when we get to the next picture, which is um, meant to be startling, although it hasn't got a human being in it, which doesn't help, this is actually a six meter long piece of um, granite that is actually uh, 35 centimeters, one foot wide at its narrowest, and is reckoned to be um, impossible to make without the machine. It's, if you use the normal percussive means to take stone down, as a sculptor would, it would actually snap. It's an extraordinary thing to watch. Um, the last slides I want to show you in this is this uh, extreme paradox of um, Master Mason's father is still very active, though he's 80-something uh, years old. He specializes in building these impossible objects, or apparently impossible objects. This is a, a stone sphere, perfectly crafted from within the stone that it's capturing it. There's no trick here. And so the um, strange situation we have is the master mason on the right-hand side discussing using all the latest technology how he's going to produce the stone. Himself, he's a, a sculptor. Meanwhile, his father is busy on site um, making these, uh, at, you know, in the ages of, of late 80s, uh, mid-80s, making these apparently impossible objects. My concluding comments are that the Sagrada Familia continues to celebrate its construction by giving the public maximum access to the process of its making. I've tried to give you a very short overview of what those innovations might be, all of which are visible except for those which are off-site. Um, this has always been the case, and Gaudi himself was extremely generous um, by taking time out, as I said at the beginning, with um, visitors. And the model makers are still on show today, and anybody in, entering the main space can examine the building operations for those that are left. But really, it's actually going to be the exterior of the building, which is going to be the part that's going to be um, available. So just trying to put this clearly in the, in the topic, which is the public space, the, this building is a public building even during its construction. There is a sense of um, almost sadness that part of it is no longer going to be a building show, but actually a building which is going to be used for its purpose for the first time in over 100 years. But I am curious to know um, how we will be able to unlock the security issues that surround the procurement of buildings. Because if we don't, we're not actually going to be able to use any of these, this list of things that were in the, um, in the brief, the, the case of uh, media, embedded memory, sensor networks, actuated building components, media facades, etc. None of this is going to do much uh, to help us question, celebrate and educate these profound te not technological shifts if we don't actually deal with the security um, um, paranoia that actually tries to hide all this from the public. Thank you very much.